we do have people who, how many people have never been to Oak Ridge before? Well, great. Well, welcome. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll do a little introduction of myself and talk a little bit about computing over the last few years and, and, and a little bit more in depth on one particular project that I'm familiar with. So we'll just um, kind of romp, romp through this. Um, so if I turn this on. Um, so um, I've had a kind of a weird, weird career. My degrees are in nuclear engineering, and I got them got my degrees right as Three Mile Island was happening. I'm an old guy, um, perfect time to get a nuclear engineering degree, and um, I kind of went in a different direction. Um, I went out to Los Alamos National Lab, um, did a bunch of stuff in um, mainly very computational, computationally oriented the whole, the whole time, uh, fluid flow, radiation transport. In 97, uh, I took a little bit of a strange detour. Um, I went and did, uh, went to a little company called uh, Blue Sky Studios outside of New York City. Um, and it may seem, seem really strange, but uh, they actually started their rendering code, ray tracing. They did very physics-based rendering. And they actually started with a radiation transport code. Uh, it was started by a small group of people who took a radiation transport code that they'd used for shielding and things like that turned it into um, a, a rendering code, and used it to, to make beautiful images. Um, and I'll show some of them uh, toward the end. But it's, it, when I tell people this, they always think it's very odd. But one of the things I did at Los Alamos was radiation transport. And, and they were very physics-based. And the philosophy at Blue Sky Studios was uh, that people time is expensive, computer time is cheap. And uh, the founders actually did the images for Tron. That was I'm not that old. It was, it was, that was before me. Um, uh, and every, every frame that they did up through, you know, uh, fairly recently was ray traced, which is kind of insane because uh, we're talking about through the late 80s and into the 90s and all through the 90s. Um, and so their render times were w way beyond what other studios were, were doing, but they could make very, very beautiful images. But it, they struggled a bit because the computational power wasn't really there, but they were really on the right track. Uh, um, let the computer do the work. You can put in a, a, a light, and, uh, and the shadows will fall in the right place and things like that. So they were really ahead of their time. Um, and it, was, it was a fun time for me. After a few years, after we finished um, the movie Ice Age, um, I decided to go back to Los Alamos for another seven years. So I kind of think of that as a, as a sabbatical. Um, um, and that's when I uh, led a computational physics group, and, and I worked on the, a supercomputer called Roadrunner. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a minute. Because um, it, it, uh, the echoes of, of, of that architecture are still happening. There's Chris. <laughs> um, um, and so then in 2008, um, I came to Oak Ridge and formed this group that, uh, that Rich mentioned a minute ago. And we've done all kinds of things from uh, nuclear energy, uh, um, reactors to batteries, simulation of batteries, and when do they go into thermal runaway and that sort of thing. So that gives you a, a, um, an overview of where, where my perspective is, and we're doing some other things now. Um, so just, just for a little bit of fun, I wanted to, um, I'll start and end with this picture. Uh, um, so I want you to take, take, a, take a little look at this, look at it for a few minutes, and tell me I'll come back at the end and say, you know, what's, what's wrong with this picture or these pictures? So just think about it. You don't have to answer now. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it at the end. OK, now, completely different direction. OK, so the Department of Energy has a bunch of different, la different national laboratories. Does anybody know how many, how many there are? <laughs> yeah, the number I usually think of is 17, but if you actually count this, there's, I think there's 19. I think they're counting some other things in here, but they're a bunch. You, you, you usually think of Los Alamos, Livermore, Berkeley, Oak Ridge, um, but there really are a, a, a whole bunch of them that are part of the, the Department of Energy scattered around the country. Um, these are the ones you think of a lot that have, that have been around a while, Los Alamos and Sandia, Livermore, those are uh, NNSA labs. The other thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that different, different national laboratories are kind of managed or owned by different parts of DOE. And so they have, that reflects their, their different mission, core mission. They, they, they all work in a lot of a, a broad 
uh, spectrum of areas, but each lab kind of has a, has a core mission that's, that's driven a lot by who their, their managing office is. Um, so for example, you see uh, Oak Ridge here is an office of science lab. These others are NNSA labs, and others are uh, like NREL is the EERE, the Renewable Energy Laboratory, and Fossil Labs, there, here's NETL. Um, so that's a, just a, a point of interest that, that, that a lot of people aren't, aren't aware of. This is another way to collect those. Uh, I, I find it a little confusing, um, but it is interesting because you can group them kind of by, on a spectrum from science to technology, and then from uh, multi-purpose laboratories like Berkeley and Brookhaven, Argonne, and, and multi-purpose security labs. So this is an attempt to, to kind of give a spectrum. Uh, it's, 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 it's maybe even more complicated than a, than, than a political spectrum these days, um, is, is how to map the, the, the labs. But you can see that Oak Ridge is really um, kind of a balanced many multi-purpose laboratory. So it, it really um, gets funding from a, a number of different, different offices. Um, so it, is, it did evolve from the Manhattan Project. It's, it goes back to the, the very earliest days of the lab system, uh, the same, same time as, as Los Alamos. Um, and, and there were, uh, um, so, some of the main things were the separations of, of the uranium and uh, looking at ways to separate plutonium from irradiated fuel. So, so um, it's got a, got a long history. And you may know that there's a, it's now two parts, uh, Y-12 and, and the main campus, Oak Ridge. At, at, the, at the time, in the earliest days, it was, it was one uh, entity. And this, this campus here was called X-10, and that was Y-12. And over time, they were separated. Um, and Y-12 is managed by um, NNSA, and we are managed by Office of Science. OK, so, um, so I already kind of hit this. But uh, just to give you an idea of the size of uh, about 4,400 employees, a um, little under $2 billion uh, um, portfolio, um, and, and really a diverse uh, portfolio of, of projects from uh, science to uh, user facilities like uh, Spallation Neutron Source, HIFR as a, as a reactor, and then the, the computing facility. So really, uh, those are kind of the, the anchors. Uh, you can think of it. Um, uh, um, as the user facilities are, are made available uh, to, to really anyone. So that's a difference between, say, the computing facilities at Oak Ridge versus at Los Alamos and Livermore. They have large machines as well, and we, uh, you know, we, we kind of go back and forth uh, who's, who's on, on top there. Um, but the difference is that our um, large f um, computers are user facilities. In, in other words, anyone can apply to get time on those machines, and that's, that's quite different from the machines at Los, Al Los Alamos and Livermore where they're behind the, the fence and used for uh, stockpile stewardship um, applications. This is our, our breakdown in funding. Uh, and you can see, again, the large, largest uh, fraction is, is from science. Uh, and then, then the, others, the rest is split between uh, energy. And so this would include the nuclear energy portfolio and, thing, and renewable energy and that sort of thing. And then the national security um, uh, mission. OK, um, so wh why, do we, why do we build these big machines? Um, uh, you know, and it, it's because you know, over time, computational power resources have, have grown so much. And I'll get more into that in a minute. But um, you sometimes wonder why we still need to build um, large machines. And, and really, we're, we're, we're leveraging these machines to, to push um, you know, a, a, a wide variety of applications from you know, solar energy to uh, um, astronomy, cosmology, um, ap applied areas like uh, better batteries, which I mentioned before, um, how proteins work. That's kind of a, the one, an area that's really growing. And I, I think if I were just getting out of school, I might go into computational biology because there's, there's just a ton of fascinating things happening there. I think that's, that's one of the next frontiers that we're going to um, really make, we're, we're really making progress in is um, understanding at a cellular level how our, our bodies and, and other biological systems work. Um, extreme climate events, so just a broad range of things. It, it, one of the things that really pushed things um, on the stockpile stewardship side um, was really being able to um, 
there was a, something that happened in the mid-90s. Um, we stopped doing uh, these large um, experiments in Nevada, which you might be familiar with. There are some great images of when the, those experiments used to be done above ground. People would have, they would have uh, viewing parties in Las Vegas and watch the mushroom clouds. Uh, eventually, those, those experiments went underground. And then in the 90s, they were stopped uh, altogether, and you can only do small experiments. Well, what does that mean? To, to, to keep a, the stockpile, um, the nuclear stockpile, safe and, and, and also ensure that it will, will work, there was a massive push to, uh, to push um, computational science um, because we could not, no longer do those experiments. Um, and that really, we're still reaping the benefits of that massive influx of uh, funding and resources into both the hardware side and algorithms and software. So a lot of the um, packages, numerical packages that you may be familiar with, Petsy and Trolinos and things like that, really were funded um, and are, are, uh, were, were boosted by, by the large amounts of funding to drive our computational science capabilities so that we could simulate uh, how weapons respond and how they age and things like that. And so we're still reaping those benefits. Um, and, and there's still more to, to do, which is why we continue to build these machines. So I think everybody's pretty, pretty familiar with how much the computational capability of, of systems has grown over the last you know, uh, um, many decades, and it's just, it's just a remarkable thing. But it's, it's, it's really hard to fully comprehend uh, the, the magnitude of this. So if, if you're old like me, you remember these beautiful machines uh, known as uh, Craze from the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and if you look back, um, these, these, uh, the, the numbers for these things now seem really quaint. I mean, this was a, a, essentially a single core uh, machine uh, with um, 10 megaflops of Linpack performance, um, 32 megabytes of memory. I mean, it's just r remarkable. Um, this, this one had four cores um, and could do up to you know, a couple hundred uh, megaflops. It's, it's uh, just really remarkable because now, you know, we carry around, and I made this slide several years ago, so that's a Samsung S, S5, and it's obviously obsolete now, but, um, you know, we carry around in our pockets uh, machines that are, that are, you know, more powerful than those, those uh, massive machines, which is just, uh, it just, it just blows me away. Um, another way to look at this, there's a, there's a list that's put together, um, you may be familiar with the top 500, which... Yes, it's a kind of a, um, it's not a great benchmark, and we all know that. It's a dense linear algebra problem. But still, we've got lots of data going back, um, you know, a long time. And so it's, a, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at. So I'll go through this really quickly. What you see here is the top curve is the sum of all the, the 500 uh, machines on the list over time. This is the, uh, the number 500 machine over time, and this is the uh, top machine over time. So the, so the number machine, number one machine on the list. And what you see is a couple of things here. Um, okay, the, yeah, and the, the, the y-axis here is, um, so this is gigaflops, teraflops, petaflops, and exaflops. Uh, so that's double precision floating point operations on, on this, um, you know, solving a dense linear system. Um, an iPad 2 would have made the list um, in, in 1994. So that's pretty, pretty astounding. Um, uh, this, let's see, that's a Core i7. So that would have been the, the top machine on the list in 1993. Uh, um, a lot of laptops around would have, would have been the number one machine in the world in 1993. Um, uh, let's see, what was my point of putting this on? 2002, the, the sum of all machines. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, okay, so... The, the bottom machine in, in uh, 2015 is equal to the sum of all the machines on the list in 2002. So that's another uh, interesting point. It takes about six, or six to eight years for a machine to fall off the list completely, to go from number one to not even on the list. Um, this is the machine I mentioned earlier, Roadrunner, uh, which was uh, a machine, the first machine to, to, to break a petaflop, 10 to the 15. Interesting thing about that machine is that it was the first, um, um, there, there's some other stuff that happened back in the 70s and 80s, but uh, ignoring that, 
this was the first large scale machine to, to be a heterogeneous architecture. So the, that machine used uh, AMD processors and cell processors uh, as accelerators. So most of the performance was actually on the cell processors. It was, a, it was not exactly the chip that was the same chip that was in the PlayStation 3. It was a, a different version that had better floating point performance, but still it was uh, leveraging you know, gaming technology. And that's something we, we still do, and you'll see that in, in a minute. Um, one, one important point about that is back you know, when, we, when, you, when we were using those machines like the Craze, really the computing industry was driven by the, the national labs and investment in large HPC. And that, over time, has disintegrated. It started back here um, when we were doing, uh, you know, with, with the rise of the RISC uh, architectures and Beowulf clusters and all that, that sort of stuff. Really, at that time, things really started to change dramatically. And, and instead of driving the industry, HPC was riding, started riding the, the, the commodity market. And so this was really a, um, a stunning thing that, that we were building a supercomputer out of um, gaming chips uh, that, that we didn't drive at all. I mean, IBM created the cell processor for, uh, for, for, for gaming. Um, so it, it stayed at the top for a few years. Um, and then Jaguar, this was uh, uh, the machine, a machine here at Oak Ridge uh, that went to the top. And it was, um, I, I, I sometimes make the analogy, it was kind of like the price of, uh, the price of oil going down. Um, so it was kind of the last machine that was a, a big um, CPU only machine uh, at the top of the list. Um, so that was, that was replaced here by Titan. Um, and that, that machine had, uh, had, has GPUs in it. Um, and I'll, I'll get a little more into that in a second. Um, and you, you'll notice an interesting phenomenon here. Um, you know, obviously this, the, the top, the number one machine has various plateaus through the years. But you see that this, this is a very consistent rise and it really started to turn over um, here. And a lot, we had been an anticipating that, but it really started to happen. Last thing on this slide is that uh, cost is, is hard to generalize, but um, this machine, the first teraflop machine, uh, was uh, ASCII Red um, out at Sandia, and it cost about $55 million. Um, over time, that has dropped so that at least when, uh, when Titan was put online, uh, every, every GPU in it was about a teraflop performance, and those were about 5,000 uh, bucks each. Um, and now that has dropped dramatically, uh, it's a, a few hundred bucks for a, for a teraflop. So that gives you another, another scale on which to measure this. So I, I know I spent a lot of time on that, that slide, but it might, I, I find it kind of interesting. Um, um, this is another view of that, uh, the, the, the fact that it rolls off. You, you hear a lot about uh, Moore's Law. I'm gonna, not gonna dwell on this too much, but um, you know, an important thing to think, to, to realize is that Moore's Law is not about performance, it's about um, density of, of, of transistors, and, and you can see um, that, uh, that we really started to roll off in, in frequency and, and uh, power consumption, whereas the number of, number of transistors keeps, keeps rising. So what's hap what happened? Well, around when that ha started happening, that's when you started seeing the number of cores uh, multiply. So we're still getting transistors, what do we do with them? And if we can't make them faster, we just, we, we started uh, jamming more cores on there. Um, and this happened really, really quickly. Um, if you remember that, you know, you, you were, you, you know, seldom heard of multi-core chips and then all of a sudden they're, they were everywhere. So that's really what's happened um, over time. So here, here's a list of the machines at Oak Ridge um, from the, the first Cray X1 um, back in, uh, you know, back in 2004. Uh, and, and now the, the machine, the, the last machine that was on the floor was, uh, um, and it's, it's gonna be turned off this year, is, uh, is, is Titan. Uh, so this was that machine Jaguar that had, um, that was the last CPU only machine. Titan has a, a combination of uh, CPUs and GPUs. So it's a thousand fold improvement just here at Oak Ridge um, in eight years. And I mentioned that uh, Titan is six years old um, uh, it, as, of, uh, as of October. Um, and it continues to operate, but um, it's gonna be de decommissioned this year um, in September. It actually, um, 
you know, the GPUs are starting to fail. They don't even make the GPU that's in the machine anymore. So we've got kind of a little stockpile that, that is used to, um, to, to help it limp through uh, its last few months. So it is being, uh, um, oh, uh, I've got this interesting chart on, on this is the power con consumption doing one of those LINPAC uh, runs to get the, you know, 17, 18 petaflop LINPAC run. You can see the power um, peak and then drop off. Um, um, so so the, the, the performance peaked at just over 21 petaflops, and the, performance, uh, the power is about 8.3 kilowatts. That's kind of an interesting thing. So it, it runs for, um, let's see, how, how long did that take? A little less than an hour to do that run, basically using, using the whole machine. It was the first time uh, that, that really that LINPAC became an I.O. bound problem. Uh, up until till then, uh, it was really a, it's, it's very, a, a very compute heavy, heavy problem. Um, it really used only the GPUs, um, and it was 10 times faster than Jaguar with um, only about 20% more power. So that's one of the key things that keeps happening is we, we, we try to keep getting, uh, getting performance out without blowing power through the roof. Um, this is a comparison of uh, the new machine, Summit. Summit was announced officially in July of last year. Um, it's a similar architecture, a CPU, a, a collection of CPUs. Each node has CPUs and GPUs. But now we have, have these two 22-core Power9 uh, IBM processors co combined with these six Volta uh, uh, GPUs. Um, so you can see that the node count is much uh, smaller, but each node is much more powerful. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got a, let me see. So, you know, half a terabyte of, of memory on each node. Uh, it's also got some uh, non-volatile um, RAM. Um, and, and you can see that, again, the power, the, the performance is going up by 5 or 10x, and the power is only going up, um, you know, a few megawatts. These are still large numbers. Each megawatt costs about a million dollars a year. So these aren't trivial machines to, to, to run, uh, but we're still trying to keep that um, power budget down. There's a much higher bandwidth between the CPUs and GPUs, and you can, um, you can even, uh, um, from an application point of view, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's uniform memory. It's not uniform access, obviously, the performance uh, to get to, a different, to the GPU versus the CPU memory, but at least, uh, um, um, Topologically, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's more unified. So programming this machine is, is, a, is a, bit, a bit easier. Um, this is a view of, the, of, of a node. And you can see the, the Power9 processors uh, um, and then the, the Voltas uh, on, the, on board here. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that you, know, you, might, you might wonder why um, you you, you probably tinker with, with machines like, like I do. And you know that you know, over time, you, you can only upgrade a machine so much before you have to you know, get a new motherboard with a, with a different bus and stuff. And so you know, we have looked at ways to upgrade machines rather than, rather than um, you know, get a whole new machine. And we've done that a couple of times. In fact, Jaguar was upgraded. Um, um, and we retained some of the hardware. But um, eventually, you, as, as you know, you have to you have to get a get new technology for the memory subsystem and and the, and the bus. Um, another thing that happened with with Summit and and this is um, yet another uh, aspect of of us riding the commodity the broader commodity market. Now instead of gaming, we're still we're still riding GPUs, which are were originally driven by the gaming industry. Something else happened with, with Summit. Um, and these, when we got these GPUs, the Voltas, NVIDIA, this was not driven by us. Uh, these, these had, um, NVIDIA had put on there these tensor cores, um, which are basically in silicon um, instantiations of a, a, of a four by four uh, accumulate add, um, multiply add at half precision. So not 32-bit, but 16-bit. And it turns out this is, um, I'm not an AI expert or a machine learning expert, but I believe that's a core uh, function in TensorFlow um, and maybe some other machine learning algorithms. 
And so they put it in silicon to make it, make it um, this uh, really perform well. And so we just got that as, we're just, as, a, as a ride along. I mean, it's, uh, it's part of the, the, the GPUs that we got on, on Summit. And so we're, we're working hard to try to figure out how best to use that. It's already been used for a, a couple of large calculations. And so you'll see some of the news releases say that Summit has, has done some calculations that exceeding an exa-op. Notice that they that were careful to say exa-op and not exa-flop because flop is, is, is really defined as a double precision, a 64-bit floating point um, operation. And these, the, the, the um, calculations that are happening at over, over an exa-op are using mixed precision. So they're using these uh, uh, half-precision operations as well as single precision. Um, to do particular parts of the calculation. So that's really a fascinating part of Summit. And another aspect of writing um, a, a broad commodity um, market, because AI is just is, is, is huge right now. Um, I, I do um, consider myself to be a bit of, I have been a bit of a skeptic on, on machine learning. Um, and this is the XKCD joke about machine learning. Um, and my, the way I, I, I do think that it's, it's extremely powerful, but the way I'd like to summarize it is physics is not the same as guessing whether to show me an ad for camera, a camera lens or diapers. It's a, it's a fundamentally different thing. However, I do think there is, um, there is, is, um, uh, is value and, and there, there's some really neat things happening. So I don't want to dismiss it. Um, but I do want to think, do, do think that there is a difference, um, and, and it's in, in filling the gaps uh, in, in models that we have for physics and, and uh, looking at the, the experimental data and providing those links. But I think we have to be careful, and I think the link to physics is, is critical for those kind of problems. Just my, uh, uh, my, my, my opinion only. Um, one more picture of the, of the beautiful Cray machine. Um, every node of Summit is, about, is over 50,000 times uh, the performance of the Cray XMP, which just, I, that, that just blows, blows my mind. Um, so one last thing on this, uh, on Titan, 90% of the performance was on these GPUs. Um, on Summit, that's continued. It's 95 to 98%. So that means if your calculation, your simulation is not using the GPUs, you're really wasting a lot of energy. You're, you're using that 13 megawatts and you're, you're making a lot of heat. You're not, you're not getting calculations out that you could. So there's really a big push uh, to get applications using uh, CUDA and other mechanisms for using, uh, using the GPUs for, for, for calculations. Um, and you know, as, as these machines have gotten larger and larger, the, the part, some people in the community really expected there to be a rise of specialized machines for different, different types of problems, um, either graph problems or uh, fluid flow or, you know, that would, that would you know, be perfectly suited. But that really hasn't, hasn't happened. Um, um, it, it, we, we continue to have hardware evolve in a way that kind of is, a, is, is a, a somewhat balanced and can do um, we, can, we can make it do uh, different kinds of, of simulations. And that's, it's been kind of a, kind of a nice thing. I, it, it still could happen, but, um, but it's nice because we, we, we tend to be able to do our traditional HPC modeling and simulation, computational science, and now we're doing more and more data analytics and, uh, and AI. Um, and so all on, on the same machine. And it's kind of nice not to have uh, a, a, an explosion uh, you know, uh, of, of different architectures. Um, I'm going to accelerate a little bit. Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll just point out, this is what I mentioned earlier, that um, there have been these calculations like um, uh, uh, bioinformatics, this, uh, um, a run that, that was exceeded two exa-ops, um, again, using mixed precision. Deep learning, this exceeded an, ex, an exa-op or a, a sustained exa-op. Um, and then a, a finite element solver accelerated, got a, a 25x speed up. Uh, that was a, an earthquake simulation. So we have, have had several uh, applications start to get ported to Summit and use the GPUs and, and, and demonstrate some really, really nice results. 
and th these are these are continuing to come in, and they are are showing about a 10x 10x speed up on uh, versus Titan. So there's there's a ton of work going on to get getting codes running over there. So the next machine beyond Summit that's already uh, been through a, a bidding and and, and uh, a bidding process, and uh, we're expecting that to be announced um, sometime over the next few months. Uh, but this this will be fielded in in the 2021 time frame, so it takes a, a long lead time to to get these machines um, you know, through a, proc a procurement process and bidding and 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 get everything set up. But um, like I said, Titan will be turned off this year. Summit will be the machine um, of focus for the next uh, few years, and then then Frontier will will come along. Um, there are tons of, of challenges. I mentioned the, the, the aspect of using the GPUs. Um, we could build an exascale system right now using uh, um, the current technology, but it would take a, about 300 me uh, megawatts to run, so nobody wants to do that. Um, um, so really, we, we, we need to continue to push the, the uh, hardware to get uh, more performance at, at, um, at, at reasonable power levels. You can. There are really a couple of different uh, paths that have, that have been uh, that are being pursued. One is tons and tons of, of smaller processors, cell phone type uh, type things, um, processors, or millions of, uh, of GPU or accelerated type type nodes. Really, you know, obviously um, uh, Oak Ridge has been more on this on this path using accelerated hardware. Um, and we'll, we'll see where that goes. But in, in, in either of these, there are computational science challenges. Um, the architectures are getting more heterogeneous, more hierarchical, with levels of memory uh, just keep getting added. Very high flop to byte count uh, ratios. Um, so these single program, multiple uh, synchronous, you know, parallelism type uh, problems get, get, get harder and harder to run on these large machines. We're, we're seeing a move toward um, asynchrony, uh, asynchronous operations, more of a, a pile of a pile of tasks that need to be done that can be can be spawned and 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 uh, managed uh, almost independently, um, and so it's really a, a, a dramatic change to uh, to to our codes and our al algorithms. Data movement is is really expensive and computation is really cheap, and that that continues to be true. So a lot of the things that um, that we used to think about, like you know, saving a divide here or there, or a multiply and storing it rather than recomputing it, that all changes too. And it's much much better um, if if you have a piece of data, just recompute something if you need it because that's so cheap um, compared to moving a piece of data somewhere where where it's needed. Um, so th these kind of paradigms are are really changing the way the applications have been built, and some that were built. You know, decades ago, that for for very important problems, need to really be completely rethought um, for these new machines. Um, uh, fault tolerance: as they get bigger and bigger, these machines get bigger and bigger. We, the applications need to uh, recover from uh, from soft and hard errors, anticipate faults, and be able to keep running if a if a node fails due to memory or the GPU or whatever. So all these things are, 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 have an impact on the software, uh, both at the operating system runtime level, um, up through the, uh, the numerical libraries that a lot of applications rely on, and the applications themselves. OK, let's see. So, so there's a large program in DOE that's joint between two major offices, the, the NNSA uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, manages the labs like Los Alamos and Livermore and Sandia, and the Office of Science, which manages us and Argonne and PNNL and Berkeley. Um, so it's a it's called the Xscale Computing Pro Project, um, and it's really designed at, at attacking this, accelerating the hardware development by working with all uh, vendors across the board: um, Intel, AMD, Micron. Uh, um, NVIDIA, IBM, they're all involved um, here on the hardware side. Um, you know, we can't drive, we're not driving new chips, but we're driving uh, technology to use them or maybe, maybe doing tweaks at, uh, um, at the interconnect level and, and things like that. And then the software 
these, these are the uh, numerical libraries and run times that, that, that enable things to run. And then on the application side, there's a, there's a batch of, um, of applications being, being funded. Um, so really the goal is to get all of this stuff ready so that when those machines like Frontier start to roll out, start to be deployed, we can actually use them. So we can use Summit to prepare for that. And so that's what, that's what we're doing. Um, keep the power envelope low, uh, low-ish, uh, 20 to 30 megawatts. Um, but we're looking for another 50x performance um, increase. Um, uh, this is the, the spectrum of applications that are being funded through ECP. And it's the broadest, it's the, I've, I've been in DOE a long time, and this is the first time I've seen this level of investment in, in the application, on the application side preparing for a machine that's coming out. You, it's got your typical um, applications like stockpile stewardship, um, uh, fusion, um, uh, uh, fundamental science, but now we see a much broader uh, spectrum of applications, including uh, reactor design, small modular reactors, uh, power grid, carbon sequestration, um, uh, cancer research, climate change, just a, a broad spectrum uh, that's being, being invested in to, to try to pair, prepare these applications because there are science impacts that can happen across these and they're very different uh, set of algorithms and codes and for, for each of these areas. And so we want, we want to be able to use this machine as soon as it comes out to, uh, to, to, to push the science boundaries. So I've, I've made this one in, in red because that's, that's the, the piece of this that I'm leading. Um, so it's added to manufacturing of, uh, of metal. And I think I've got a couple of slides on that. Yeah, I, yeah so if you're, uh, you, you're probably familiar with 3D printing, added manufacturing. Um, it's been around a long time, um, but it has really exploded over the last few years. Um, it's, it was initially for rapid prototyping, so creating things um, uh, um, to see how they look and see how they behave. Um, um, but the, the materials and economics were not really useful beyond uh, prototype um, at that point. But it's really exploded over the last three or four or five years. Um, and it's not, um, you know, you, you see a lot of polymer type parts and, you know, there was an explosion of the, these machines at the, you know, a few hundred bucks you can get a 3D printer and, and start making stuff. What you may not be, uh, be as aware of is we can do that with metal. Um, titanium, stainless steel, a lot of uh, nickel-based super alloys, inconels, and, um, and, and, and make uh, you know, metal parts. And actually there's a, um, um, I mean, it's being NASA and, 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 and others are, are, are really pushing the boundaries of, of this. Um, so, the advantages are, are you can make things that are very complex. The complexity is almost free. It's not really f free, but it's, you can make these very complex things. You basically, um, you, you know, if you've got a CAD program, you can, you can design it. Um, there's less assembly time. You can build a, a part that's very complex and has different moving parts that are all kind of built together. There's less waste. And you can take, do things like replicate. You could, uh, you know, scan this guy and, and build another one. Uh, you know, optically sit, scan it, convert it to CAD, and then, and then build other ones uh, like it. So you can do it. This is a picture of actually repairing something using, using, um, uh, using additive manufacturing. So what happens is you've got a, a feedstock, which is, uh, you know, it could be a wire or you, you, often it's, it's a powder, uh, titanium or stainless steel or whatever, and you hit it with a, either a laser or an electron beam, melt it, and you do this layer by layer. Um, so here's how it works. You take a CAD model, uh, you, make a, you, you, you mesh it up, you slice it, um, and then you, you come up with a tool path. That, so the, the tool here being the laser or the electron beam, and you build every layer, um, uh, you build the thing layer by layer um, until you get a, a finished part. Now these layers are, you know, 30-ish microns, you know, 30 to 50 micron powder particles. So it, it's not a fast process. Um, but, it's, uh, but you can do, do some very complex things. You might imagine that uh, it's, uh, so, so what are the limitations? It's, it's, not, it's not cheap right now. The machines are, are fairly expensive. They're, you can only do fairly small things, although that's changing rapidly. Um, 
um, and it's slow, as I mentioned. It's, uh, it takes a, takes a while to build these parts. It could, can be hours or, or days. Um, and, and if you're not careful, you get poor mechanical properties. Um, uh, um, and, and surface finish is another consideration. So this, you can see the, uh, the surface finish of this, this screw. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of challenges. And, and the biggest one, one of the biggest ones to me, uh, and that's interesting from a science standpoint, is this uh, mechanical properties. So the, um, the, the processing parameters have a d direct effect on the microstructure of the metal, and which has a direct um, impact on the properties of that part uh, of that piece and the uh, and the fatigue behavior and failure behavior, so that's what we're trying to um, improve in the the project that I'm leading. So the underlying physics is is very similar to welding. Um, you know, you've got melting, solidification, uh, uh, fluid flow in the melt pool, uh, phase transformation even after it solidifies, and then and this rep repeated heating and cooling. Uh, in this project, we're looking mostly at um, uh, at powder beds, which is where you have a, a powder, like I mentioned, and you hit it with a, either a laser or an electron beam. Um, and I mentioned this, this, you, this scan pattern. So this is a picture of the microstructure you get from traditional manufacturing processes. It's nice and regular, you can see. And it's, th this is a, a typical additive manufacturing microstructure. It's kind of a mess. My, if you're not used to looking at these, I, I wasn't uh, until I started looking at this, um, this topic. Uh, but th this is not really desirable. You've got these long, skinny grains, and um, whereas this, these are kind of similar size and, and equally distributed, it gives you a much better uh, properties in that, in that piece. The good news is, in a, in a way, is that, a, that you can um, control by controlling the speed of the, of the laser, the, the path that it takes, um, the power of the laser or the E-beam. Uh, you can really, you really have a ton of control over the process parameters that, that create these microstructures. And so it's very repeatable, uh, but then getting those settings just right uh, for the part and the de uh, what you desire is, uh, it, it can be a challenge. So that's what we're working on. Um, if you talk to material scientists, they'll, they'll very often talk about this linkage between process, what's happening at the melt pool, uh, and the impact that has on, on structure. So pro pro process, structure, properties, performance. Each of these influences the other. Um, so the, the process parameters determine the microstructure that you have, the grains, how, the, si the distribution of size, the orientation, and then that uh, directly impacts, like I said, the properties, the, the, the strength and the, the yield, and then uh, which, which directly impacts the, how, this, how the part performs eventually. So the reality is, um, so we've got a, the, the reality is it's not a nice linear, uh, linear thing like that. It's a, it, it's a complex uh, coupled feedback, set of feedback loops between what's happening at the melt pool driving the microstructure, and it's a, it's a, it's a loop that, that, um, uh, where the, that microstructure, uh, in addition, is, you know, like I said, it's repeatedly melt, melted and solidified as, as you grow the grains. So really, you have to, uh, what I've done is uh, put in these boxes the, the different numerical approaches for, for simulating different parts of this. So at the melt pool, you can do you know, your, your typical fluid flow CFD calculations, uh, finite volume, finite element, mesh-free particle methods, whereas you need something completely different to do the, the grain evolution at the microstructure. Um, cellular automata, kinetic Monte Carlo, phase field, different approaches, and then Lagrangian finite elements to do the thermal mechanics. Um, the point is that there's no single code, simulation code, that can do all of this. And what we'd like to do, what we're doing is, is, uh, is, is um, developing a set of codes to run on summit uh, and 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 do all of, all of these at an unprecedented um, fidelity, so that we can um, understand the processes and then and and this linkage between the process structure properties. Um, okay, so let's let's assume we're we're going to be successful with this, creating a suite of codes that can can do that simulation. That's going to allow us to to do virtual experiments on on the machine. So. There's a big question of, of what, how, how important is the fluid flow in the melt pool? Um, there's some evidence uh, that, that the, 
even though this, the melt pool is, is tiny, you know, you've got the, the electron beam hitting it, and it's just you know, several tens, tens of microns uh, um, wide and deep, uh, the velocities of the, of the flow in that pool can be meters per second. So there's a lot of churn in that, in that, um, in that pool. But it, there's, a, there's a big question how significant that is to the eventual uh, grain size and grain growth. Surface tension is a big unknown. Um, um, you know, at the temperatures and you know, a lot of the data we have for what is the surface tension of, tungs of uh, titanium or whatever when it's molten, we don't have good data on, on, on that, those values at, that, um, you know, at, at the real um, conditions that at the, at the, during a build. Um, so we need to explore those models. The relevant significance of different, different phenomena and so we could use this thing to explore machine designs that don't even exist. So multiple beams, multiple lasers, without having to build a new machine, you know, multi-million dollar machine, we can explore could we do interesting things in the process by, by having different machine designs. Um, a really interesting thing is that I like to think of this as, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with uh, direct numerical simulation for CFD, so trying to have fewer approximations in the fluids equations so that you could you, you simulate the whole the, the full Navier Stokes equations. Um, similarly, we, we, we we're thinking of this uh, this these this set of uh, capabilities in, would be useful for that, and really generating synthetic data for to train neural networks. So, um, getting back to my skepticism of of machine learning, this is a way I think I think we can do something useful is is um, you know we don't the, the typical di big data problem for for Amazon and Google they have tons of data that they can mine to do um, uh, their you know predictions of what I had to show you and stuff on the physics side we really don't have that we we, we sometimes th think we have big data but it's really not big compared to that and so but you can imagine using um, if your if your simulation is good enough to be considered truth. Or close to truth, you can use it to um, to generate data for for neural networks, and and of, of course develop and cal calibrate reduced order models. Um, so test the limits. You, not everybody's going to have some. It you, eventually we want to be able to run to manage these machines making metal parts um, in real time and maybe fix defects in in process. Well, you're never going to do that by you know running a, a, a simulation on summit at the same time or something. So you really want some fast-running models, um, and we can use a high-order uh, set of codes to do that. And we're going to release as much as we can um, to the community, and we're already doing that. The API is to allow um, combination of components, and, um, and, and this allows researchers to focus on one set of phenomena. Let's say somebody wants to investigate just the fluid flow. They can do that without having to do the microstructure at the same time. Um, OK. so. I hope that wasn't too boring a, a divergence into uh, the depths of additive manufacturing. I tried to tried to keep it um, a little less, uh, you know, a little a little more of a of, of a romp through that. Um, but let's return to this picture. Anybody want to want to want to guess what 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 my point for showing these was? Yeah, well, that's, that's 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 true. What, what were you saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are at least reflections. They're they're actually at least trying to do reflections. So that's that's mapped on. So on on his face, the light source is on the right, but on the hand, the light source is on the left. So you so you're you're all getting. I mean, all of that's right. The, the, one that, the one that kills me, though, it, to, that to me is the most glaring, and so I want to share it with you so that every time you watch Toy Story, it'll destroy it for you, too, um, <laughs> is that there's no refraction through his helmet. All the, all the lines are completely straight, and, and it, it, would, it just wouldn't be like that. And so that, that's a dead giveaway that they're not doing ray tracing. They're not doing physics. They're just, it's a, it's a very, it's a, a, a scan line renderer, it's called. Um, it's very fast, and they, they, they could make frames for Toy Story much faster than, than we could at Blue Sky. And of course, their stories were great, which is really what's important. But, um, um, 
it's just, uh, so I w when I was at Blue Sky, I would go to um, the SIGGRAPH conference, and it was always fascinating because there was a, there was a lot of physics. There was a, a huge rise of, of physic physical simulation while, while I was doing this uh, for fire and water and stuff like that, and that's come a, a, a long way. Um, but, you know, Pixar would give talks where, you know, they would talk about cars and how they had 200 lights to, to get all the reflections right and stuff like that. And, and we, at Blue Sky, we would think, that's insane. What, that you've got a human, you've got a human that's got to place all these lights. Whereas at Blue Sky, we'd put in, we'd put in a light, maybe put in another light, render it, and it would be done. Um, and so, anyway, that's, that's my uh, 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 spiel about, about Blue Sky and... Um, and uh, rendering and, and ray tracing. Um, I'll, I'll end with, uh, so this is a, a frame uh, that out of a, a short film called Bunny that's actually on the bonus disc for Ice Age, and this, this film won the Academy Award um, in 1998, 99, no, 2000, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think it was 99. Anyway, here's, here's a case you can see uh, the refraction through the glass, so that's all happening completely naturally. Um, I, I, I just love that, that image. And then two more, um, I don't know how well they show up on here, but um, again, just you know, a single light, um, you, you get the specular reflections, and these are, these are old, these are more than 15 years old uh, images. You could do it even, even better now, but um, anyway. That's, uh, I'll, I'll stop there with a picture of Summit. Um, which I think you're going to tour at some, uh, some point. So I'll just stop there. Take any questions. Yeah. I think it was much better. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I think it was surprisingly stable. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these machines uh, are, are, not, are not a worst case. I mean, there's, uh, in, the early, in the early days of turning them on, some th things will happen, like you know, solder will be bad in some particular part or whatever. But, but once you get through that, that shakedown period, they're, they tend to be surprisingly stable. More, more, I, think, I think better than people expect. But Road Roadrunner was pretty good. It's it lasted for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.